Howdy folks, welcome back to another episode of Mingles with Jingles, kicking off as usual with Wanker of the Week. In our first submission, we join Melvinel, who's attempting to pass his scout on Kamarin in his T-71. Unfortunately for him, he's got a pair of Erwin Rommel wannabes in his team in this Waffle Tractor platoon, who have decided that the far better use of the T-71 in this situation would be rushing across that open field in the face of an enemy AMX Vosh 50 and dying pointlessly rather than actually spotting targets for them. To be completely fair, there are better places that an aggressive T-71 driver could exploit on this map, but he's not actually doing anything wrong, and he is trying to tell these guys, look, fall back, let me spot from here, and then you can get up a... No, no, not good enough, sorry. We don't listen to logic and reason around here. Heaven forbid anybody actually goes to the trouble of adapting their tactics to suit the situation that they find themselves in. No, it's far easier to just have a massive strop, throw your toys out of the pram, and start team killing the people who aren't playing the way you want them to, because there's no known cure for being an arsehole. Light tank drivers seem to have been having a pretty bad week so far, if the submissions I've been getting for Wanker of the Week have been anything to go by. Here's Iconsol having a pretty tough game in his ELC AMX. He's been stopped dead on the centre road here on Mines by this KV-1. KV-1 backed up by some very accurate supporting fire from an SU-12244 on the hill behind him. He quickly realises that pushing his luck down that centre road, especially given what's shooting down it, is only going to lead to a very quick exit from the game. So instead, he does the only thing that he can do, and he pulls back to try his luck elsewhere. But as we all know, if you're not rushing forward and pointlessly dying in all the enemy guns in the first minute of the game, you're clearly not driving a light tank properly. And spunk gargling oxygen thieves like the IFB 304 driver will be only too happy to repeatedly show you the error of your ways. 9966 here in his T49 had actually been having a really, really good game. If he survives this match, he's not only getting a Brothers in Arms medal, he's also picking up a 75,000 credit mission reward, but there's always some bitter little fucktard who's decided that if he's not had a good game, nobody's having a good game. Captain Rex 33 in the Waffentrager E100 and his buddy Humboldt 707 in the Fosh 155 are about to have their game ruined by yet another griefing asshat in artillery. Their team's Object 261 driver, there he is, has done nothing this entire game but whine, bitch and complain about the disposition of the team's deployment on this Kamara map. And to be fair to him, he does have a good point. You look at the way the teams are spread on the map, they're gonna lose. But the thing is, being right doesn't make him any less of an obnoxious whining crybaby who would not stop polluting chat with his whiny drivel the entire game. But that alone isn't enough to get you on Wanker of the Week. Oh no, rest assured, there's far worse than that coming. So, because absolutely nobody on their team has gone down the eastern flank, they've just got bum-rushed by a T-71 who spotted all three of them, there's two very strong artillery in play on the enemy team, and now they're scurrying for cover, so that they don't fall victim to follow-up artillery fire. Now, note that it is not the fault of the two Tier 10 tank destroyers that there is nobody on their team in that village to the north of their position. These are not the kind of machines that can reliably hold and cover that kind of ground without somebody up front spotting targets for them. The Waffentrager E100 is a massive target. The Fosch is helpless while it's reloading. But this is wanker of the week jingles. Don't come here with your fancy logic and common sense. After all, rather than actually adapting your tactics to fit the situation that you're in, it is far easier to just start acting like a spoiled princess and lashing out at the only tanks that are actually in a position to do you any good. And here comes the first direct act of douchebaggery. He's pointing straight at him. Yeah, that looked pretty deliberate to me. Captain Rex isn't sure, and he doesn't retaliate. And to confuse matters, the Object 261 says sorry. But he is, of course, just trolling them, as you'll see, by the next thing that he says in chat. And of course, rather than actually defend himself against this T-54, what do you think he's going to do to the Fosh 155? Yep, that's right. It is, of course, entirely possible that the Fosh 155, even though he has been spotted, and is going to be a prime target for enemy artillery, could still fight off this T-54. Well, not if the douchebag and the Object 261 has anything to say about it. Humboldt 707 in the Fosh knows that there's an enemy T-54 out there somewhere and tries to take cover behind the wreck of Captain Rex, but he's taking cover from the wrong target. He should be hiding from this scumbag 
in the Object 261 who just puts a shot into him, reduces him to 72 health making him an easy kill for the IS-3 rather than firing at the enemy T-54 who popped up right in front of him. And that, boys and girls, is why Stroganoff, the cock holster in the Object 261, is this week's Wanker of the Week. So, mingles with jingles. And you may be wondering, bloody hell, what's this? Good question. My new PC is up and running. And this is my new PC running the Firestrike test on 3D Mark and getting an average of 50 to 60 frames per second while recording video and compressing video <laughs> at the same time. Damn, this thing's quick. But, you know, 3D Mark, it's, a, it's an artificial environment. It's, it's a benchmarking utility, so I thought I'd give it a run out in War Thunder. War Thunder also actually comes with a benchmarking utility included in the game. This is the Pacific War benchmark test. Again, while recording and compressing video on the fly, with movie quality graphic settings, over 300 frames per second. <laughs> I'm never going to need this much graphics processing power, but it's nice to have it. Um, if you care, the new PC specs are in the video description. I don't want to turn this episode of Mingles with Jingles into a computer spec discussion. Uh, I will, however, um, in the next couple of days, I'll be doing the final Project Man Cave video. Um, and I'll be focusing on the new computer as well, so you'll see what it looks like. You'll see my complete gaming rig, all of the stuff on display in the Man Cave. That's coming up in a couple of days. Um, possibly Tuesday, or maybe a bonus video today, uh, after I've put Mingles with Jingles up. We shall have to see how much free time I have. So, yeah, new PC. It is it is beautiful, though. And it's huge. I mean, technically it's a desktop, but it, it wouldn't fit on the desk. <laughs> it barely fits under the desk. Wait until you see it. Now, the old PC... You know what? It's a two-and-a-half-year-old machine, but there's still some life in this old dog yet. It's still a good machine. And uh, I haven't quite retired it yet. In fact, it's now being used as a dedicated video editing and rendering workstation. That's, it is, in fact, what this episode of Mingles with Jingles has been created on. Um, I've got it all networked up so I can still upload from this machine while playing games on the new machine, as it should be. And of course, because I've got two monster gaming PCs networked in the same room, it means I can have my friends around and we can all play World of Tanks and War Thunder and whatever in the same room without having to use, you know, voice comms. I mean, we use voice comms, but old-fashioned voice comms. We talk to each other because <laughs> we're sitting right next to each other. So, yeah, it's uh, Project Man Cave, I think, has been a resounding success. Um, the final Project Man Cave video will be coming up very, very, very soon. And of course, with Project Man Cave being almost fully complete now, um, that means I'm no longer spending my days wiring computers together and hammering furniture together, and, and I can throw myself back into the normal weekly schedule. So that means taking part in the live streams again. I didn't do any live streams last week, I was just too busy to commit to them. So there was no live stream on Monday with Circumflexes, there was no live stream on Thursday with Quickie Baby. Although on Thursday night, while I was reinstalling software on the new PC, I did take a quick look at uh, Quickie Baby's Twitch channel to see what was going on in the live stream in my absence. And oh boy, I have I don't think I've ever been so grateful to not be taking part in a live stream as Quickie Baby's live stream last Thursday. He was having a bad, bad night. But hey, there's always a bright side. At least he was the only one having a bad night because I was too busy to live stream with him. Uh, well, I ain't going to have that excuse anymore. Everything's all plugged up, wired together, and ready to rock and roll. So I will be getting back into the regular live stream schedule this week, starting tonight with Circumflexes and Thursday with Quickie Baby. Details of when I live stream with Circon and Quickie Baby in the video description. And I'll have to see if Rita Gamer and Melanthus will have me along as a guest in their streams as well. I've had a lot of fun playing with them too. And while I've got your attention and we're still near the start of the video, now's as good a time as any to remind you all, well, those of you who play World of Tanks anyway, Duxter recently relaunched their World of Tanks gaming portal. And the relaunch came with a giveaway. There's all sorts of gaming goodies up for grabs. It doesn't cost you anything to enter. All you have to do is answer some questions on the Duxter World of Tanks forums. 
but the giveaway ends today. Today is your last chance to get a chance of, of getting your hands on some gaming goodies. Now, if you already use Duxter, then taking part couldn't be any easier. You literally just go to the relevant forum thread, which you can find here, and bang, there you go. Click the link in the first post, answer three questions, and you're automatically registered with a chance to win the prizes in the giveaway. Now, if you don't use Duxter, well, it's entirely up to you whether you use it or not, but I do recommend it. It is a good service. There's a lot of good stuff on there. Um, their wiki in particular, in my opinion, is better than the official World of Tanks wiki. The forums are a far, far friendlier place than the official World of Tanks forums. And if you're interested, then I have a referral code which will sign you up for Duxter in time, if you use it today, to take part in the giveaway for a chance of winning some of these goodies, as well as add me as a friend to you on Duxter so that you can see my status updates whenever I do something. If you didn't catch that referral code that popped up on screen, don't worry, it's also in the video description as well. Uh, yeah, I think that just about covers it for this week's announcements. Uh, I suppose I'm actually going to have to answer some questions now. <laughs> well, I did say normal service had now resumed. Okay, who's first? Terry Bolin asked a very good question on last week's Mingles with Jingles, and it's to do with World of Tanks and the changes that we're seeing on a lot of the maps, particularly as the 9.0 test server is coming out, but there have been changes along these lines in other maps, like, for example, Highway, prior to patch 9.0, and he's talking about the removal of a lot of the concealment that exists on these maps. And when we're talking about concealment, we're talking about the kind of things that obscure you from the view of the enemy team, but which you can fire through. So trees, bushes, scrub, things like that. Now, Terry brings this subject up because while he believes that making changes like this reduce the number of window lickers in heavies and mediums who are camping when they should be doing something more active, but it, it does screw over the kinds of machines that are supposed to fight from cover. And we're talking mainly tank destroyers here. First of all, Terry, I have to say, I think you are a wonderful optimist if you think for a second <laughs> that simply reducing the amount of concealment on the maps in World of Tanks is going to stop idiots in top tier heavies from camping at the back of the map. All it's going to do is increase the competition for the camping spots. Window lickers are not suddenly going to stop being window lickers just because there are fewer places on the map from which they can safely lick their windows. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. But Terry's comment, bless him, uh, did start a discussion going between various different subscribers in the comments section of last week's Mingles with Jingles about this very subject. And uh, Terry, my thanks for that. You know, this is exactly the sort of thing that I love seeing the comments section of my videos being used for. It is nice to see the comments section of my videos be used for something other than 300 people pointing out that what I thought was a Type 59 in the video that you all just watched was actually a T-54 jingles. And, and I encourage <laughs> this kind of discussion wherever possible. But to address your point, what we're seeing here is, uh, in my opinion anyway, it's, it's another one of the steps that Wargaming are taking to address the dominance of tank destroyers, particularly in high tier games. You know, they said they were going to do it. We've seen the direct nerfs to a lot of, particularly the tier 10 tank destroyers. Um, and this obviously affects all tank destroyers, not just the tier 10s. We're going to see further changes coming uh, in future patches where tank destroyers no longer get the camo bonus that they currently enjoy while shooting through concealment, and that's going away as well. And it's all part of the... Well, it's a serious package of nerfs across the board for tank destroyers. It, you know, it, it, it's what Wargaming want to happen, and, and this is one of the ways that they're doing it. Rather than directly nerfing the vehicles themselves, they're changing the maps to make the maps less campy overall. And as Terry himself says, you know, this is not, in and of itself, a bad thing. Removing a lot of the concealment on the maps does force a much more dynamic and, in my opinion, interesting style of gameplay. However, there are still machines in the game that rely on concealment in order to do their job effectively. The Stug 3, for example, is just one of many, many examples of tank destroyers that die as soon as they get spotted. Unfortunately, this change 
is going to make life substantially harder for those guys who drive the kind of tank destroyers, tank destroyers like the Stug, tank destroyers like the Waffentragers, tank destroyers that have no armor whatsoever and who die very, very quickly if they get spotted because they're not in concealment. And the change is going to affect them not because, not directly because there's less concealment on the maps, but because there is just the same amount of idiots on the maps. And if the amount of cover available is limited, that isn't going to stop the E100 on your team from camping that cover when the Object 704 could use it much more effectively. So, yeah, the, you know, this change is definitely, oh, well, I say change, this trend, because you're seeing these changes, the reduction of the amount of concealment on the maps in every single map that has been remodeled recently, uh, particularly with the map changes that we're seeing on the patch 9.0 test server. It's the same across the board, and it, it, it is a definite trend in World of Tanks' current map design. And it is bad, bad news for tank destroyers and other tanks, scouts as well. Scouts are going to have a hard time too, particularly passive scouts. It's not just the tank destroyers. Now, you could argue, and you'd be absolutely right, that it's not necessarily all doom and gloom. What it means is you're going to have to adjust your tactics um, and play your tank destroyers in a way that you can play tank destroyers now, but people don't because there is so much concealment on the maps. And instead of just occupying a position right at the back and hiding in a bush, instead what you should be doing, if this is the case and there is less concealment on the maps, is following behind your top tier heavies at a safe distance so that you are out of view range of the tanks that your top tier heavies are engaging and you can provide second line fire support to your top tier heavies and that's a fantastic idea but it assumes everybody plays intelligently <laughs> and we've already established that your top tier heavies are camping the bushes at the back of the map so yeah yeah um hmm problem. Let's just say I think it's an interesting time to be a tank destroyer driver and it's only going to get more interesting when patch 9.0 comes out. I mean I do agree that particularly in top tier games the dominance of tank destroyers needed to be addressed and they have done that with the nerfs in particular to a lot of the tier 10 tank destroyers but stuff like this removing a lot of the concealment from the maps it, while it's not something I am against, because I, I, you know, as a medium tank driver, I like the idea that it, the battle is going to be more fluid and more dynamic. But at the same time, sweeping changes like this don't just affect the tier 10 tank destroyers. And, well, I don't know. Uh, have people really been going on the forums complaining that the Churchill gun carrier needs a nerf? <laughs> Are well, there really hate threads on the forums about how the ARL V39 is so incredibly overpowered and, you know, needs to be balanced? I don't think so. And yet, these are the machines that are going to be affected by these changes just the same as everybody else. One thing I can guarantee you is that no amount of concealment changes like this are going to prevent dumbass KV-2 and KV-1S drivers from camping in whatever concealment is available at the back of the map and using their derp guns as if they're sniper rifles. The only thing that's going to change is that because they're still occupying the sniping spots at the back of the map, the vulnerable tank destroyers are going to be forced to expose themselves, and it's going to be a real interesting time to be a tank destroyer driver. Speaking of tanks, a whole bunch of you have been asking, and, you know, justifiably so, Jingles, where the hell are the War Thunder Ground Forces videos? Well, as I am speaking, the new PC is currently downloading and installing War Thunder Ground Forces development server. As soon as that is done, you're going to be getting more War Thunder Ground Forces videos. There's all sorts of reasons why I haven't been doing much in the way of War Thunder Ground Forces videos lately, um, not least because of the server schedule. That they, It's not like the World of Tanks test server that's pretty much always up whenever the test is running. Uh, the War Thunder Ground Forces server is only available at certain hours of the day, and it's not available at the same time in every time zone. It, it, it's a really it's a real funny way that they've gone about organizing when the server is going to be up. And sometimes, a lot of the time, it's just not convenient <laughs> for, 
for me to get onto the server. So that has been an issue, but it's not the only reason. One of the other reasons why you haven't seen an awful lot of gameplay from me uh, in the last couple of weeks from the War Thunder dev server is um, I, I suck at War Thunder ground forces. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people might argue that I suck at World of Tanks as well, and eh, that's another argument, but I am really not very good. It's, um, uh, you know, at War Thunder Tanks, it is completely different to playing World of Tanks. You know, the two games couldn't be more unlike each other, and that's a good thing. Oh, hold on while I just obliterate this KV1S. <laughs> I'm sorry, did you see that? Why would you do that? Why would you exp just more more guys like that on the enemy team, please? Yeah. Well, anyway, yes, War Thunder Ground Forces. Y you know what it's like when you jump into a new game and you don't bother reading the manual. <laughs> you know who bothers with manuals these days? Games should have tutorials, um, and you have no idea what's going on. But you just think, oh my god, this is awesome. I, I have no idea what I'm doing, but it's awesome, and you can see the potential in it. Um, and you want to get good at it because you know that perseverance, learning how it works, doing things properly is going to be so much fun. And, and I'm kind of like that with War Thunder Ground Forces. My problem is that I have been polluted <laughs> by playing too much World of Tanks. And I keep trying to do stuff in War Thunder Ground Forces that is almost second nature to me now from playing so much World of Tanks, but it just gets your dumb ass killed in War Thunder Ground Forces because it is so much more realistic. And I like that, but I'm no good at it. So, you know, it's kind of like the situation I was in with um, War Thunder historical battles with the aircraft in that, you know, I could see that it's going to be so much more rewarding to get good at uh, War Thunder historical, well, historical, they call them realistic battles now, but you know what I mean. But in order to get to that point, I had to play a lot of it, and it's kind of like that with War Thunder Ground Forces as well. So, I'm, you know, I'm just going to have to play a lot more of it. And you know what? Even if I continue to suck at it, and, and I can't master it and just end up being no good whatsoever at War Thunder Ground Forces, doesn't matter. Just the fact that it exists is fantastic news for all of us. Just look at the amount of innovation that you're getting in World of Tanks in such a short period of time. Things like historical battles in World of Tanks, havoc physics in World of Tanks, turrets blowing off tanks that have been amaracked, um, destructible buildings, you know, all this new stuff that's coming in World of Tanks in such a short period of time. Why do you think, well, I'm not saying that, you know, Wargaming haven't just pulled all this stuff out of their arse at the drop of a hat. This stuff has been in development for quite some time. I know for a fact that historical battles in particular have been in development at Wargaming for at least two years. Now, when I say in development, I'm not saying they've been throwing a lot of resources at it. In the case of historical battles, two years ago, in development just meant they had somebody doing feasibility studies and taking case notes from the player-run historical battles that were being uh, run on the EU server. But suddenly, practically overnight, in World of Tanks, bang, historical battles, they're here, they work, they're on the test server, and they've just popped up out of nowhere. It did not take a massive amount of resources on behalf of Wargaming to just fix a battle so that all the tanks on one side were German and all the tanks on the other side were Russian, for example. This is something that they could have easily implemented at any time over the last two years, but we're getting it now, and we're getting it at the same time, more or less, as we're getting Havoc Physics, Destructible Buildings, and so on, and so on, and so on. The reason we're getting all of this now is because of War Thunder. People want to reenact historical battles. People want to reenact the Battle of the Bulge. People want to reenact the Battle of Prokhorovka. Um, War Thunder's historical battles work. They have proven that there is a market there for people who want to reenact famous battles that took place in history. If there was no market there for it, you wouldn't be getting it in World of Tanks, and it's because War Thunder have proven the viability of offering this kind of game mode, that's why you're getting it in World of Tanks. Remember when the first video footage came out of, uh, at, you know, at the Igrimir Games Conference in Russia? Of War Thunder's ground forces, and everybody saw the turrets getting blown off KV-1s? <laughs> Remember how much of a stir that caused? And suddenly, well I say suddenly, 
but you know we're getting this in world attacks as well it's there it's it's on the patch 9.0 test server now yeah obviously you don't just pull something like that out of your ass overnight again this is something that has been in development for a while but i will guarantee you that the pace of development has shifted up a couple of years the second that video footage appeared from igramir all of this new stuff that we're getting over a real short period of time in world of tanks is directly attributable to the success and popularity of War Thunder offering it first. And it doesn't matter whether you love War Thunder or hate War Thunder. The fact that War Thunder exists is fantastic news if you're a World of Tanks fan. All of which is a hell of a long-winded way of saying, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be playing more War Thunder Ground Forces. <laughs> Come on, you guys know what it's like around here by now. You never get a short answer to a question. <laughs> you love me just the way I am. <laughs> How far are we into this week's video? 25, nearly 26 minutes. Okay, right. Time for a few more questions. A gaming panned. Uh, he wants to know, Jingles, you mentioned in the Mingles with Jingles that it takes you anything up to 10 hours to actually make the Mingles with Jingles video. Why does it take so long? Well, first things first, I need to get some background video footage, like this War Thunder game, uh, for me to talk over while the video's running. Uh, now, in the case of a World of Tanks replay, that means I have to spend in the region of 10 minutes per World of Tanks replay file trying to get some usable video footage. And here's the thing. It can't be a really, really bad game, because that's just not interesting to watch. And it can't be a really, really good game, because I'll want to use that for a video of its own. So I have to find a World of Tanks replay that's interesting to watch, but isn't good enough to get its own video. Now, luckily, there are plenty of those. You know, the majority of my games are fairly average. But I still have to find those fairly average games. And while I can watch the game at, you know, double speed or even four times speed to find out what kind of game it is, once I've found out what kind of game it is, I still have to record it in real time. So we're talking probably in the region, on average, of 20 minutes per World of Tanks replay just to get five or eight minutes of background footage in a Mingles with Jingles video. That's World of Tanks. Then we move on to War Thunder. Now, I don't play as much War Thunder as I play World of Tanks, so I don't have as much to choose from when it comes to War Thunder replays or live video files that I've recorded while I'm playing War Thunder. And when I do get something worth watching in War Thunder, it generally tends to be reserved for its own video, which means that as far as the background footage in War Thunder is concerned, what I have to do a lot of the time is flash up War Thunder and play some single missions or dynamic campaigns in order to get the background footage. Uh, that you see in War Thunder. Not this one, this was actually the very first game I flew in my F5F Panther. Um, you know, this is live gameplay footage. Well, it's not live, it's from a replay. Uh, this was completely accidental, by the way. This guy did not mean to fly right into me. <laughs> uh, War Thunder, you so silly. But yes, anyway. The good thing about flying some of the single missions in War Thunder, by the way, is you do get some very, very impressive uh, video footage, particularly of formation flying. Uh, some of the ways that the single missions are set up are very, very impressive to watch. Um, and, and you do get a lot of video that you just would never, ever get playing an arcade battle or even a realistic battle. So that in itself isn't a bad thing. But it means that I, specifically for Mingles with Jingles, have to go out and play something purely for the purposes of getting background footage for Mingles with Jingles. And that can take an hour, an hour and a half, two hours. Because I then also, as well as playing it, have to go into the replay file and then record the video from the replay so that you don't see the UI all over the place. And it makes it, you know, a nice impressive video to watch. So there's that for War Thunder. Then I have to figure out what the hell I'm actually going to talk about. Now, I am blessed with the ability to waffle on at great length... <laughs> Uh, on just about any subject under the sun, but I still have to find something to you know to start from and that means going back to the previous week's Mingles with Jingles and looking through thousands of comments and, and that can take some time. And then of course I have to actually record myself talking about it and contrary to what you may believe, 
And I know that watching a Mingles with Jingles video, it may seem like this is what I do, but what does not happen is that I sit myself down in front of the computer, press record, talk for 35 minutes, press stop recording, and then stick that audio file on top of the video. It just doesn't work like that. To begin with, none of this is read from a script. And that's something that people have asked in the past as well. Jingles, do you have a script for Mingles with Jingles? No, nope, no script whatsoever. I might have a couple of subjects that I decide, yeah, that's what I want to talk about today. And I just start talking. Um, and then I review what I have said. And I might think to myself, there's a better way of saying that. And I'll think about it. And then I'll try it again and again and again until I'm happy with the way I have expressed whatever it was I wanted to talk about. So for any five minutes of speech on a Mingles with Jingles video, there is probably 40 minutes of recorded commentary that didn't get used just to say the same thing. And what will also happen is that, well, I start off talking about a subject and I may have a very definite opinion on that subject. And then, it, you know, it takes me a while to find the best way to express my opinion on that subject. But then something often happens halfway through that process. And it's almost like um, collaborating with somebody else on a topic. And to give you an example of the sort of thing I'm talking about. Years back, when I used to play Airsoft every weekend, myself and one of my teammates, Carl, we used to actually write and organise and run the games at Combat South, the airsoft site that we played at. And the way it would work would be that I would always write the first draft of whatever game scenarios we were planning to do the following weekend. And then I would email them to Carl, and Carl, you know, with a fresh set of eyes, would look at what I had written, and he would spot all the obvious mistakes that I couldn't see because I'd written it. And so, between the two of us, we'd come up with a watertight plan for the next weekend set of games that could survive just about anything that a bunch of idiot players could throw at it. Now, it's not exactly like that when I'm doing a Mingles with Jingles video. There's, there's just me here. There's nobody else to listen to what it is that I've said and say, well, there's, have you thought about this? But because I do review everything that I've said multiple times, often that'll get me thinking a different way of looking at the same subject. And it, it may change my opinion on that subject. And as an example of that sort of thing, if you go back to the very first World of Warplanes video that I did, while I was recording the commentary for that game, and, and I absolutely hated World of Warplanes, and I thought it sucked, and um, I pretty much still do. <laughs> Sorry, World of Warplanes fans. But while recording the commentary for that video and going over the reasons why World of Warplanes sucked, it occurred to me that, you know what? The fact that World of Warplanes exists in exactly the same way that the fact that War Thunder exists is a fantastic thing for World of Tanks players. The fact that World of Warplanes exists, even though it's not any good, is a fantastic thing for people who play War Thunder, because World of Warplanes could only get better. Right? It would have been physically impossible for it to get any worse. And World of Warplanes has gotten better, and the fact that it is getting better, and it's, you know, it's, it's always snapping at the heels of War Thunder, makes Gaijin constantly feel the threat of the competition catching up with them. And that never occurred to me until I had almost finished doing the commentary of the World of Warplanes video. And of course, having that fresh perspective on World of Warplanes meant that I, you know, I, I looked at the whole thing in a completely new light, and it meant I had to go right back to the beginning and do the entire commentary for that video again bearing in mind this new revelation that I'd had about World of Warplanes right at the end of doing the video. And that sort of thing happens all the time when I'm doing Mingles with Jingles. And that's why Mingles with Jingles can take anything up to 10 hours for me to do. What I thought I was going to say on a subject is usually got absolutely no relationship whatsoever to what I end up saying on the subject by the time I'm finished doing a Mingles with Jingles video. This one actually hasn't taken quite that long. This one was only eight hours, so that's not bad for a Mingles with Jingles, although I still have to render it and then I have to upload it. So yeah, give it another two hours and bingo, there you go. 10 hours for a Mingles with Jingles. I hope it was worth the time. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it because at least now you know what goes into doing one of these videos. As always folks, take care out there, have fun playing whatever games you're playing and I will catch you next time.